Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Don't Risk It podcast presented by VFIS Client Risk Solutions. This program focuses on the exposures our clients frequently encounter and discusses the potential solutions to help reduce these exposures. I'm your host, Chris Rogers, with VFIS Client Risk Solutions, and today we're discussing the use of body cameras in EMS. I want to welcome Tim Hearn to the program. Tim is the Executive Director of Fort Smith EMS out of Fort Smith, Arkansas, and he's here to provide some insight on how his organization integrated body cameras into their emergency response operations. Tim, I want to thank you for joining me today. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you today. That's great to hear. So when we think of body cameras, at least from from my perspective, I uh, you know the first thing I think of is is the police side of it versus uh, versus the EMS side of emergency services. So why did your department decide body cameras were a priority for your organization? Well, we felt that uh, given some incidents over the last couple of years, uh, namely some of our employees have been attacked by the patient or family or, or that kind of incidences uh, that that we would uh, investigate and see what we could do and see if body cameras could help us. So is there a... So we went that... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, so that's that's kind of direction we decided to uh, investigate and go towards. Is there a, is there a training program uh, that, that had to be implemented, you know, to, to kind of give the providers a, the do's and don'ts of this system? We did. What we uh, first did is we, of course, searched out uh, the body camera that we thought would work for us. And uh, and uh, we started out with uh, just a, a sample one and kind of tried it out. And using that, we developed a, 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 some procedures for training. So uh, once the, our board approved going forward with body cameras, we did uh, issued, uh, mandatory training with all employees that would be wearing body cameras. And uh, that involved probably a couple hours of course, we covered the what, how to activate the camera, how to deactivate the camera, et cetera. And then we also covered some rules with them on when it can be activated, when it should be shut off, you know, when it shouldn't even be turned on, those kind of procedures. So you kind of mentioned in, in your first answer that, uh, you know, that some, some of your providers were being, um, for lack of a better phrase, attacked. Um, well, so what was the, we're going to kind of harken back on that. Was this program designed to capture patient interactions? Is it, was it an incident management uh, ordeal or, you know, kind of what was the reasoning behind it? Well, we basically looked at it for incident management only. Uh, we, we do not use it for patient management, uh, even though there will be some times we capture that that's considered incidental. Uh, we basically uh, just use it for managing the incident. We get rid of he said, she said, or what really happened in some cases. And of course, there will be some patient capturing on there, but we consider that incidental. So the the initial reason was to um, for for internal personnel versus um, you know how they're interacting with the patient. Like you said, th- those things could pop up, but the the main goal is um, f- to to improve your your staff. Is that is that an accurate statement? Absolutely. We want to. We just want to be the best we can be, and so we want to make sure that our our staff is uh, not only behaves appropriately, but is treated appropriately in the field by uh, police, fire other health care providers, families, and et cetera, and that we treat them appropriately also. And it's, it's unfortunate that, um, you know, first, uh, first responders are being assaulted out on, out on calls. So uh, you, you kind of have to go this route in some degree, to some degree to, uh, to protect your personnel, like you mentioned. Absolutely. Uh, it's times have changed and uh, the video speaks the truth every single time. So we've decided to go this route just to, for protection of our employees and of our, of our community. So this is always, you know, probably the biggest legal hurdle whenever we're talking about medical care and video. Um, you know, what hurdles did you have to overcome in order to get this program off the ground? You know, legal concerns, other concerns. Well, we first drafted a, a policy uh, using some uh, police department policies and uh, from different ones, uh, areas, and we kind of started putting together the puzzle of how we could use this and, and how we, would, would, would it be for patient care, would it not be for patient care, how would we maintain stuff with it. So, of course, we have a, a, a contracted legal counsel, so I ran it through them. Also, I ran it through like two other legal sources just to get a consensus of opinion on how to work this out. And it it took us a little while. 
I mean, we started this closer to the first of the year. Uh, I didn't been investigating it prior to that, and I started engaging my board first of the year. And it took us probably about six months of research on how best to handle this legally, and we did that through uh, body camera policy. That's great to hear. I'm guessing, other than finances, legal uh, legal concerns are probably two of the biggest hurdles to get uh, to get this program off the ground. So good to hear that uh, you you went to multiple avenues to make sure you had those bases covered. Absolutely, we wanted to make sure that. Uh, we didn't infringe on anyone's rights, and we also didn't uh, do anything that could get us into trouble legally. So speaking of uh, legality and, and, and rights, um, you know, what measures do you have to take to ensure that there's no HIPAA violations uh, using this program? Well, it, we can use these for patient care, and we chose not to. And if we choose not to, then, of course, then we have some HIPAA concerns. And so uh, for camera recordings uh, with HIPAA, it is allowed uh, with under the Protected Health Information Act. And what we did there was uh, we just made the patient contacts that we might record as incidentals and use it, like I said, as innocent management. We did uh, get an opinion from a HIPAA attorney on this, and uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't violate anyone's rights there. The biggest problem you run into if you're going to record it as a patient care device, uh, then is storage of records, uh, which is six years. Uh, and we did not want to have to store all these incidents for six years. Uh, we didn't feel that well, that wasn't the reason we were trying to use it. And so we didn't want to have to follow in those guidelines. And that's a lot of data to record when you've got it on eight trucks at one time. Uh, so that's 16 people wearing cameras. And it, and it crews a lot of, you know, hard drive space. So we didn't want to go that route. For sure. And that's awesome that you, you went to a, um, you know, a legal counsel that, that kind of specializes in uh, HIPAA policies because that's, uh, th- that's their bag and that's the best place to get some of that information from to help you out. Absolutely. They, like I said, we used three different legal sources and, uh, and got the same opinion from each source. They helped us develop our policy. They gave us, you know, we didn't send them a perfect policy to start with. We sent them a rough draft and they said, scratch this, add this, that kind of things. And, uh, so, uh, and in the end it worked out for us real well and, and we're real happy. Nice team effort. Nice team effort. So, you know, once uh, once a crew comes on shift, you you know, you mentioned that the cameras aren't the cheapest thing, and uh, and and you know, that's a lot of data to uh, to to maintain. How are the cameras deployed to the staff uh, when they come on, and then then how do they you know relinquish that camera back to the uh, back to the organization? Well, unlike uh, police departments, which uh, have I think each officer in, in a lot of cases has their own assigned camera, we sign cameras to the, the on-duty trucks that day. So uh, we, we, they have to come in and they have to sign out a camera when they, when they come in for shift. And each one is, is dedicated to certain units. Uh, we, we know by the serial numbers of the camera, but they know by a sticker on it that this goes to this unit. And then those people, they undock the camera. We have a docking station in a secure, secure location. And they come in, they undock the camera, make sure it's, you know, it functions properly and they can do a quick test on the camera just to see if it comes on. And then they wear that camera that day. And at the end of the shift, when they're, before they go home, they come back and redock the camera and the oncoming crew picks up a new camera and, uh, and goes through the same procedures again. Nice. Nice. So, uh, are, are the cameras, what, sorry, let me back up when the crews, you know, get the camera for the day and they get, they get in the rig, are the cameras always on or can the providers turn them on and off for applicable or non-applicable events? Uh, they're not always on. Uh, we looked at several different procedures there. Uh, one was always on. Another one was, uh, it had it was kind of always on, kind of like your TV, how you back up live TV, and it would back up so much time. Uh, that that really infringed on batteries uh, in the in the rechargeable cameras, and so we chose that they have to activate the camera. And so we actually put that in the policy when they can activate the camera. Uh, so they have uh, the rights to activate the camera, and our policy is is when they leave their station 
and are on a 911 response, they automatically activate the camera. Then when they re uh, get to the hospital, uh, they deactivate the camera when going into the hospital, thus not capturing anything going on in the halls or patient rooms at the hospital. Uh, we actually met with both uh, CEOs and uh, their IT people at both hospitals to say, you know, we're going to be coming in with cameras on and we won't record. And they were very happy about that since they have cameras in their hallways and can, can capture any incidents. And since that what is that is what we were trying to do was incident management. We realized they were already capturing it inside the hospital for us. So we shut our cameras down uh, when we enter the hospital. Uh, they have been instructed that if they do have an incident in the hospital, something's going wrong, uh, maybe there's a disagreement about patient care or a disagreement about something with the patient or whatever incident you can manage, they can activate them in the hospital just as they need them. I think one of the takeaways from this is how much communication and prep work that you all did before you all uh, got this program rolled out. Not only did you go to the legal route, but you went to the, the hospitals that you're going to visit and let them know what you're going to be doing and, and let them know beforehand to, and to not to. So because sometimes cameras scare people uh, that, that they think that you're there to try to catch them doing something. So uh, getting all the stakeholders involved and let them letting them know what you were doing and what the goal of it was. I think that that was probably um, very beneficial in, in making this program a success. Absolutely. That was uh, part of our longest process was making everyone understand what we were trying to capture, why we were trying to capture it, and when. And once we got every all the players on the same page, everyone was in agreement that was a, a good process. Uh, the police department knows we uh, are recording when we're seen with them. The fire department knows. I mean, we, we reached out to all of our stakeholders and said, this is what we'll be doing. And uh, they they could express their concerns and would even meet with them one on one and explain to them, you know, why we were doing it. And uh, no one really had any issues with it once we got to the end of the day. So you, you kind of talked about uh, data storage concerns and security measures earlier. Um, but with the way that you all are using the program, um, what are, what are your uh, procedures for data storage and security because you're not using it for patient interaction per se, um, that it, that it doesn't have to, it, it's not as long as that, is that correct? Right. Well, what we do is we, uh, we chose to, instead of hooking it to our in, entire service system that is, you know, connected with the cloud and does, you know, our EPCRs and stuff, we decided to make this a standalone server and, it would not have any outside access. There's no outside access to this server because we do capture some pa a lot of patient interaction. And so we want to protect whatever information we have, even though we're not going to use it for our electronic patient care reports, we still want to protect it. So it's a standalone server. Uh, it's housed in our 911 center. So they have to actually come into a secure location to get their cameras. And they're on camera, actually, <laughs> When they come in the center, there's like four, four to six cameras in our 911 center that captures everything there, including uh, voice. And so they come in and they check out their camera, sign it out. And uh, so with that, it, it causes us some inconveniences if there's an incident on the weekend and one of the administrators are, are not in the building. Uh, we can't log on anywhere and see the incident. We have to actually physically come into the building pull the camera, you know, dock it to one of our computers and pull the incident off of it. Uh, we just can't, uh, or if it's if it's still on the camera, that is. Now, our cameras, when we put them in the, the docking stations, it, it clears the camera off. So if, once you end shift, and I'm backing up a little bit, but once you end shift and you dock it, it, it wipes the camera clean and stores everything in a 64 terabyte hard drive that's standalone. So no one can access anything. A camera's blank every time they pick it up. So that's another security measure that if the camera gets lost or something, the camera's blank when they pick it up. So that well, helps us too. With in, in this era of data breaches and whatnot, I think that it, it's great that you have, even though it's, you, you mentioned it's kind of a, a burden sometimes to have to come up and pull that data and whatnot, having that limited and restricted access to that server, um, probably greatly reduces the uh, potential uh, for some type of cyber theft of, of that data. 
Yes, that that is correct. We're trying to just we're trying to keep our information safe and secure and actually unaccessible through any parts of the web or you know through the internet at all because we just decided that since it would have that some patient information on it, we would just uh, eliminate it uh, there so they couldn't no one could access video. Well, let's uh, let's say uh, you know I work for Fort Smith and you know Chris Rogers and uh, and I come in and I think I just did a bang up job on a call and I want to I want to share that video with everyone. Uh, can the crew members uh, view the videos of calls they were on uh, at their own discretion and sh- and share that information? No, they cannot. Uh, they are. It is a company on camera. The information captured belongs to the company. It is not for them to review their patient care on there. Uh, the only, excuse me, the only time they would actually get to see any video is if we were researching an incident by it and we felt we needed their opinion uh, on this video, what what was what was being what was going on at the time, give us a little background, that kind of stuff. We might bring them in on the video. We've had uh, a handful of events that we've reviewed and we've never had to bring the crew in at all about it. I mean, the camera speaks for itself for the most part. There's no screen on the back of the camera. I think there's some video cameras have a little screen on the back, and they can kind of review the video they just recorded. They would have the ability to, some people would have the ability to delete or edit. Uh, these cameras cannot be edited. They cannot be viewed from the camera. Everything on the camera is completely secure, and they can't even access the information. There's no USB port or anything like that. It has to be in with its in the docking station to pull stuff back off of it. It's a, it's so a singular system. It's a singular system. There's not a, there's not all these um, uh, peripheral things that you can plug into it to pull off of. It's a it's a single system that has to hook up to a one connector to pull that information off of and, and whatnot. That's correct. It has to have the software to pull it off. So if you haven't purchased the software, then you can't pull information right back off this camera. So it was more than just buying a camera. It was buying, you know, the docking stations, the server, the software that we could actually access the information with. So that just, again, secures it from anyone that, you know, say we lose a camera during the day and there are recordings on it. Uh, There's no way for someone to access it unless they have all the software, the docking stations and everything else. So, you know, a normal person in the public would not have access to anything like that. And so the camera would just be a, a paperweight for them. Absolutely. An expensive one. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, you mentioned that you haven't really had to, you know, to, to use the system a, a whole lot. Now, I know it's recording daily, but I mean, as far as like uh, incident management or whatnot, but are, are there established criteria for when a video will be pulled and, and used to help manage an incident? There is. Uh, we, we've uh, given our medics several examples of, of issues uh, that we would pull, uh, you know, we could have a an incident with, like we talked at the first of the podcast, was uh, say the medic is attacked or the medic, medic is hit or slapped, that kind of stuff. Or there's a incident with disagreement, maybe with other responders at the scene, uh, whether it be first responders, whether it be police, whether it be fire, whatever. Uh, sometimes it's an educational piece. And uh, so... We, we give them several different types of incidents of when they, you know, can actually pull this or ask us to look at this. We do not randomly just go and watch video. Now, with that said, initially, when we started the program, we would pull random videos just to check for quality and what we were seeing and if they're wearing them properly on their vest and, and those kind of things. But other than that, we just do not watch video because it would be minute by minute uh, to watch video, you know, times eight units, and that would be very, very time-consuming. So we do it on uh, uh, maybe there's a complaint, maybe there's an incident, maybe they realize something, maybe the hospital calls about a patient saying, you know, the medics took my wallet or something, and I gave it to them to hold, and they didn't give it to you. Well, we have video of that incident, so we're, again, checking incident management on that call is all we're doing. So, And we've given them several examples of, of times that they can request it or if they come up with something and say, hey, this happened and I think you need to review it. Well, if they request that we review it, we're going to review it. If we if 
we have anything in our findings, we'll let them know our findings on it. And if someone calls in, uh, you know, we don't discuss employee matters with the public, but we would certainly use it as an educational tool for our, our paramedics. We did write into our policy that some video could be used as an educational purpose. Uh, we haven't really had anything that we felt that we needed to use thus far, and I don't know that we will. Uh, but we did write in the policies that we could use it as educational purposes as long as it did not breach HIPAA for a patient. So I'm going to uh, round out the, the, the line of questioning here. Um, you've kind of touched on this several times, but I, I just want to you know clarify it with the last question. Uh, are these procedures, um, are they documented in a written policy? I know you've said the policy, so I'm, I'm guessing yes, but can you just elaborate on that one last time? We do. We have, it's actually about a six page policy. It's pretty elaborate. Uh, it started out at maybe, you know, just some ideals on a couple of pages and we just kept expanding and, you know, and we didn't reinvent the wheel here. We went to several sources so that we could, uh, uh, you know, see what everyone else was doing. We didn't find many EMS services even recording. Everyone was talking about it, but they were afraid of the, the HIPAA stuff. And so we wanted to put a very comprehensive policy, uh, everything from activation, deactivation, prohibited use of recordings, unintentional recordings. I mean, we just went on and on. And uh, who wears the cameras, uh, uploading the recordings. We, we very went very extensive on our policy, uh, maybe a little more than we had to, but we felt we'd be safer that way. Uh, we covered public records requests. You know, uh, we're not a uh, uh, foyable entity that they could pull these kind of records as, as far as a public records request and neither do we allow them to be subpoenaed I mean they can you know anyone can issue a subpoena but there's also a quash that we can go on because now then we actually have the HIPAA part that we can quash a subpoena based on patient information so that kits us out of, we haven't had any subpoenaed, but fortunately for me, the prosecuting attorney for our, our district is actually one of my board members. And so he had, he was one of our insights into developing the policy. So we have a very extensive policy and, and we shared it with other EMS services. We don't, like we said, people shared with us. We want to share with you. Uh, we want you to not, you know, try to reinvent the wheel here and, if you need a copy of our policy, we'd be happy to share it with you so to give you something to build on. Oh, we would love to have it as an attachment to the uh, to the podcast for our listeners to download, um, you know, if they listen and like what they hear and, and want to try to get started. Uh, would, would you be opposed to that? No, oh, not at all. I'd be happy to send it. Perfect, perfect. Well, Tim, um, it was a pleasure talking to you, man. And as always, I uh, this is why I wanted to get you on because, uh, as you said, there wasn't a lot of organizations doing this program. There's a lot of organizations talking about doing this program, but uh, you you all took that leap, and you did a really uh, really nice job of making sure you had all your uh, uh, all your ducks in a row before you uh, before you hit record on the cameras. So um, I, I want to thank you again for joining us, and uh, it was, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Chris. It's always good to be here with you. And I want to thank you for listening to the program today and for your interest in VFIS safety resources. I want to thank our guest, Tim Hearn, once again, for his time and information. Please consider subscribing to our program to stay up to date on new content releases. Also, if you like what you've heard, please consider leaving a review below. For more information about the many resources available from VFIS, please visit VFIS.com. And to submit ideas for future discussions, please reach out by email and VFIS risk control at VFIS.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this program are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of Gladfelter Insurance Group, VFIS, and its employees. Additionally, all views, information, or opinions expressed are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal, medical, or other professional advice on any subject matter.